John's Air Force Service included 139 combat missions. He is the recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with nine oak leaf clusters. John began his aviation career at the age of 10 when he built a Comet Structo Speed. Anybody here ever heard of one of those? I figured, <laughs> I figured a couple of people, that's why I put it in here. Uh, his first control line trainer was a Thimble Drone TD4. Remember that one? His first RC was a Junior Falcon with an ACE RC single channel receiver and a citizenship transmitter. Okay, very good. Although he hasn't flown RC recently, he still has a top flight um, uh, quick Fly 3, a Sterling Chairman, a SIG J3, a Sterling Cessna 180, and a Willows Bilanca 1410 Cruise Master, all of which he says are operational. So I think that's great. All right? John's daughter is also a pilot. She owns a Taylor craft, but on 9 11, she and her F 16 were among the first responders launched after the first planes hit the World Trade Center. Please join me in giving John Penny a warm AA of welcome. Can everybody hear me without the microphone? Yeah. yeah. It's easier for me to move around. If somebody uh, can't hear me, just raise your hand and uh, I'll pick us up and use it again. Can somebody uh, get the far left light switch on the uh, wall over there? That will shut down this row of lights here and that will make it easier. And uh, I'm going to try to stay out of everybody's as much as I can so you all can see the video here. First off, I want to thank you all for inviting me to come tonight uh, to the meeting and, uh, and share with you some of the experiences I've had with the uh, Rare Bear Air Racing Team over a period of uh, just a little over a quarter of a century, starting in 1985, when I first raced. And um, I've uh, <clears throat> been privileged to uh, talk to several groups, and I always enjoy talking to modelers and pilots and stuff. And, and uh, because some of the facts and figures we'll talk about tonight are things are pretty interesting uh, to uh, uh, to hear about and, and, uh, and understand what makes uh, the rare bear the fastest uh, world's fastest airplane, uh, propeller driven airplane in the world. So uh, tonight we'll uh, talk about the, the rare bear, talk about some facts and figures, so we'll talk about the national championship air races at uh, Reno Stead and, and uh, a little bit of the history of the rare bear. Here we are in the lineup, I think. Right. Get this thing to work. Here we are in the lineup right here. I think that was uh, 2008 in the races there. The Rare Bear, as Larry said, was a uh, highly modified Grumman F8F2 uh, Bearcat. It was the last propeller-driven airplane uh, fighter that was uh, developed for World War II. And it came on right at the end of World War II, never really saw any combat. They got two squadrons onto an aircraft carrier that were on their way over in the Pacific. The war in Europe had already finished. and. Um, they were just about uh, to their destination uh, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and the war came to an end. So, some, some of the uh, things that are uh, particular about the rare bear, it has a, uh, instead of the, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 uh, round engine, 18-cylinder uh, uh, radial engine, we use a Curtis Wright 3350. There are a lot of airframe mods, the wings are clipped. Uh, if, how many of you are familiar or seen uh, pictures of a, a Grumman Bearcat and the profile of it? Well, you can see that the, the, the cowling line here uh, takes a, a little turn as opposed to going straight down to the cowling, uh, to the front of the cow. That's because the engine is tilted up from minus six degrees of thrust line, which gives the airplane a lot of pitch stability when they're coming aboard the boat to do a landing. So, but that creates drag. So we get rid of that drag by tilting the engine up a little bit. And that's what I talked about, uh, a zero thrust line here. The Curtis Wright 3350, 18-cylinder, uh, I've seen up to 4,500 horsepower on that, on that engine. <coughs> 3350 means 3,350 cubic inches versus 2,800 cubic inches on the Pratt Whitney. 
So if you do the math and divide that by 18, you'll probably find that each one of our cylinders has more cubic inches probably than at least half of the automobiles that are being driven by the people in the crowd here tonight. And uh, divide 4,500 by 18, and I think you'll also find out that one each cylinder in this engine develops probably more horsepower than most of your cars do. The propeller on the Rare Bear is a 13 and a half foot propeller off a, uh, uh, a A1 Sky Raider, and it has a, a very narrow cord to it, which causes, uh, which brings us less drag and actually develops more thrust than a big wide cord, which is good for climb but not good for speed. And um, the uh, spinner on this airplane is off a uh, British built bomber called the Blackburn Beverly. And because uh, if you are, again, if you're familiar with the configuration of a Grumman Bearcat, there is no spinner on it. It's just kind of a flat plate out there with a little, the hub for the uh, propeller on the front. Um, the, uh, we do get uh, out of the exhaust, we get uh, some thrust augmentation uh, from there, and, and I think that's good for about 70 horsepower, somebody calculated the way the exhaust comes out the side of the, uh, of the fuselage there. And it also, the exhaust as it comes out, helps draw some of the air out of the accessory, out of the power section of the, uh, of the uh, cowling gear and helps cool the engine. You can see the canopy's trimmed way down. Again, another picture of the brake and the cowl line there. This cowling is a cowling off a uh, uh, Douglas DC-7 airliner. <laughs> and that, that is it's a specifically fit uh, uh, to, to, to encase the 3350, allow the proper amount of airflow to go through the cowling for cooling. And, uh, and again, you can see how the, the spinner increases the finest ratio and doesn't make the Bearcat look quite so stubby, but it's still one of the stubbier airplanes out there in my you know, compared to the Mustangs. There are no wing flaps on uh, on the rear bear. Uh, normally, uh, on the Bearcat, the wing flaps come on down to about 45 or 50 degrees to slow the approach as the Navy pilots will fly this thing aboard the boat and uh, land on the carrier and catch a catch a cable. All the control surfaces are paired uh, with fill-ins. Um, the ailerons here are trimmed to, to uh, they're only about uh, three feet long. But uh, people say, gee whiz, you must not have enough aileron control. <clears throat> but at the speeds we're going, what little deflection we do need from the ailerons gives us plenty of lateral authority, roll authority, when we're on the race course and carrying turbulence or trying to maneuver on the race course. Um, the, uh, we have an oil cooler exhaust here. This was in an, in an earlier configuration. And actually, the heat rejection coming out, out of the big oil cooler radiator, the airflow going through there would give us about 100 pounds of thrust. <clears throat> Too much of a trigger finger on this thing. Now this, you're going to see several different configurations, several different paint jobs, and a couple of different propellers. We did race for several years with a, with a three blade propeller that came off, the blades came off of Lockheed P3 Orion. The Navy patrol boat, <clears throat> it's a turbo, turboprop powered airplane with four engines. And um, this blade, as you can see, is not very thick. It's got a fairly radical twist to it. Um, <clears throat> and it looks like it's sitting at a very, very high pitch angle. If you think about the props that are on the RC models and stuff that you're flying around, they don't, none of them, unless you're flying, uh, say, one of the pylon racers, None of them have a, a very radical blade angle. This is the low pitch angle for this propeller. Now take a look at that, and you see this, this little fairing right here on the spinner. That's where, at, at the high pitch stop, when we're up at racing speed and have racing horsepower to it, that's where the blade twists to to maintain the uh, maximum RP, or, uh, the R RPM down below 3,200 uh, engine speed RPM, uh, which is what we race at. So it gets to be a fairly radical, here again you can see where the high pitch stop is. It's almost aligned directly into the, uh, 
into the slipstream as the airplane goes forward. This propeller was optimized for running the three kilometer speed record because the, uh, the blade is very, very thin so that when you get up to high speed, you don't get uh, the propeller blades getting a sh uh, mock, uh, shock wave on the blade. If any of you, uh, those of you who may have gone to Green Air races, when you see those airplanes, you hear the airplanes coming around the race course, the P-51s always come around with a very loud rapping sound. And that's because they're getting supersonic flow out near the tips of their propeller blades, and that is actually causing inefficiency and reduces some thrust. Now, it didn't happen with this blade here. We would, Our tip Mach number was about 0.96, but we were still saying subsonic, so it was a, a nice a chest uh, shaking and rumble when, when uh, the airplane came by with the street blade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as you can see, uh, you try to see if you can find uh, very many uh, seams from the uh, from the sheet metal work on the airplane there. It's all filled in, bondoed, sanded, and, uh, and uh, primed and painted to, to be just as smooth as we can get it. And uh, we always have people come by the pits, hey, you want somebody, you know, I'll volunteer to polish your airplane for you. Do you have any volunteers in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the line of volunteers is only about a mile long out there in Reno. <clears throat> so, everything we talked about here with the engine and the prop uh, makes the Rare Bear the world's uh, fastest <coughs> driven airplane. And uh, it still holds the world's three kilometer speed record which is kind of like the crown jewel of records uh, in, the, in the FAI record books. You know, there's, there are some model airplane records that are in the FAI record books, too. Um, you know, various categories of things. But um, Lyle Shelton, the previous owner of the airplane, went out and, uh, and set the speed record down at, at uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, back in 1989, at 528 miles an hour. And what altitude? Um, you have to be lower than uh, 100 meters uh, above the ground when you come by on the course. So you're all, you, which, when you go to set a world speed record, the question was what altitude you come by. Um, it's it's uh, four legs back and forth, and uh, it's a three kilometer course measured, and uh, you have to be no higher than basically 300 feet above the ground when you come down that course back and forth. So what you look for is the highest altitude airport you can find with flat terrain around us. You can make the turnarounds because you can't go above 500 meters during your turnaround, which is basically 1,500 feet. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And you don't want to bleed off energy as you're doing this. I'm getting into some technical stuff about the three kilometer speed record. But uh, you want a higher port, a hot day, so the density of the altitude is higher, so your true air speed will be as, as fast as you can go because we can. With nitrous oxide, we can develop all kinds of horsepower out of this. <laughs> this is what the uh, cockpit looks like in the rear bear. That's the picture I took a few years ago. It's uh, it's kind of uh, kind of business-like. We have have four flight instruments in this airplane. How many of you all are pilots for full-scale airplanes? We got a few here. So we have. An airspeed indicator, we have an, al an altimeter, which during the race, you're flying around there visually, you're not looking at an altimeter. This is just to make sure that we can take the airplane cross country someplace and fly where we're supposed to be flying. We have a G meter, so we can measure the number of G's we pull on the course. And we have a compass, which doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> instruments associated with managing the power and all the switches over here, managing the power and the supporting systems for the airplane. Um, Who put the bumper sticker in it? <laughs> oh, that was one, that, uh, our guys uh, on the race crew uh, went out and got that. And then you see there's a, how many of y'all saw the uh, movie The Right Stuff? Yeah. Remember when Chuck Gators asked him, hey, Ridley, you got any payments? Yeah. Oh, I got me a stick. We'll know what we Pay it back. So they put a stick of game in there. I, that was back in uh, 2002. They did that. I still have that. I, it's all dry and hard, but I have it in my pile of stuff. So, but um, 
um, if you take 10 minutes to describe what all the various instruments are for, but they're all required uh, to monitor the health of the engine. Uh, the one, uh, these two instruments right here are the primary health indicators. We have oil temperature, uh, oil pressure, fuel pressure, and then torque pressure. Because the horsepower is a direct, uh, horsepower is, is calculated by measuring the torque of the engine. You know, when you, if uh, you have a hot rod and you step on the gas when you're sitting still, the engine will twist like that. That's torque. And uh, times RPM divided by a factor, that's a direct readout of horsepower. <coughs> Anytime any of the racing teams go out there and win, it takes a, uh, it's a phenomenal effort by a hard working crew, which this crew since 2002 has been the hardest working, most dedicated air race crew that I've been associated with since I've been flying a rare air uh, since back in 1985. And um, it's, a, it's a thankless job that they do. I try to thank them as much as I can. And uh, come December, pardon me, we always, my wife and I host a, a four day weekend up at our house. We go out to Farm Range and fly our Piper Cub and we uh, have, a few, uh, have a few libations at our house. And uh, have a for it. So it's a fun deal. But uh, that the hard working crew needs good crew chiefs. Uh, back in 2002, starting out, we had Stacy Thomas, our current crew chief, with Dave Cornell. And um, Dave Cornell is a guy who did all the engineering on the rare bear uh, to make it go out and get that three kilometer speed record at 528 miles an hour. The guy's brilliant, self educated engineer, probably S9Q 200, and eccentricity to go along with it. But he, he knows everything about this airplane more than anybody ever has. He and I have been great friends for over a quarter century. For those of you who have been out to the Reno Air Races and know anything about that, you know that in the evening there are times where there are crews out there working through the night because during a race something went wrong, they got to change the cylinder. They got a, a, a new, uh, you know, adjustments timing and whatnot. But uh, you know, our crew has been known over a period of uh, a week there at the air races to spend three or four days, basically just nonstop, 24/7, doing the support work to, to make the rear bear race as fast as it does. On the engine start, it requires a, it's it's a very it's a, a the engine is highly modified also, so it requires a. Very special technique. There probably aren't too many people in the audience here familiar with round engine uh, uh, procedures technology from some of these World War II fighters. But um, uh, we uh, get the engine cranking through for about uh, 12 blades, which uh, gets oil starting to circulate to all the parts in the engine. And then we bring on, we have four magneto switches. Uh, there are two spark plugs in each cylinder. We have two banks of cylinders, so there's four magneto switches to, con to control each one of the row of each one of those uh, spark plugs. Turn on the spark plugs, turn on the boost pump, make sure we've got pressure going in uh, there, and uh, bring the, uh, the mixture up to a, uh, a normal idle or uh, idle detent slightly lean, which you don't normally do on these, on these big engines, but we have to do it on this because the blower, the uh, supercharger has a, a special configuration of these that start tick, what we call tickling the electric primer that takes fuel from the uh, fuel filter and puts it directly into the cylinders and when it fires off then you uh, go ahead and uh, bring the throttle up a little bit and then uh, let off the primer and, and you get it running smoothly. Easier said than done. <laughs> Take off. You guys were at the Reno Air Races uh, a few years ago. You remember seeing the rear bird take off? You notice how nose high it is when we take off? That's because the landing gear, the limit speed on the landing gear for retracting is about 125 knots. We only use about 1,500 horsepower on the takeoff because if we use much more than that, the P factor ends up being too much on that propeller in a three-point in a three point attitude. There's not enough rudder to hold the airplane straight on the runway. But what I'll do is I'll go out there, we'll uh, get lined up, lock the tail wheel, bring the throttle up very smoothly and very slowly to about uh, 35 inches of manifold pressure, 
and the uh, RPM is set at 2,600 RPM. Rolled, started rolling down the runway. You can't get this airplane into a level attitude like most tail draggers do, like the, like the tail dragger models at the out of the uh, airfield. When you take off, take those things off, you get the tail up, roll a little bit, and then, then she takes off. This propeller is so long that if during the takeoff roll, if your airplane bounces at all, the propeller tips will start to strike the runway. So we have to take off in a tail low attitude. Now what that does is that um, uh, the airplane in that takeoff in that takeoff attitude wants to lift off at around 90 knots indicated airspeed. Well, the power off stall speed for this airplane is about 95 or 96 knots, and that's because in flight, uh, in, in, at low speeds, the 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 uh, airflow from the propeller directly across the wing here is providing quite a bit of the lift. Okay, so there's an no old man's line there right after the lift off. If the engine quits uh, between 90 and 95 knots, the airplane's going to stall as opposed to just gliding down into the runway. So, but we pretty rapidly accelerate beyond that uh, 95 knots, and but we have to bring the nose on up to keep it from overspeeding, uh, otherwise the gear will not come up and lock all the way. And there's a picture later on that shows where we have, we've had some problems where the gear hasn't locked all the way up and it caused some problems uh, uh, during uh, one of the races where we couldn't get one of the gear down uh, initially. So, um, and what you're seeing here is in our latest configuration of what we call a boil-off system. I talked to you before about the oil cooler radiator and the air going through there. Well, along with some thrust, that creates some drag. Uh, and it's called a cooling drag. So the boil-off system takes that same radiator, puts it in a vat. We, we submerge it in this vat with 50-50 mix of water and methanol, and it boils it off. And we have a system to replenish that. And so what you're seeing here is the initial Right after takeoff, uh, we service it high enough that we're spinning out a little bit of uh, raw uh, ADI fluid right out of the, uh, the exhaust for the, uh, the boil-off system. Here's one of my favorite pictures, an older picture of the rear bear with a three-blade prop. You can see in this picture uh, a good illustration of uh, how big the prop is compared to the rest of the airplane. The propeller diameter is over one-third of the wingspan of the rear bear. So we get things going, we're, we, we can develop it for 4,500 horsepower. When we get that horsepower running about uh, 75 inches of manifold pressure, 3,200 RPM, um, we have a, a system called a de-enricher, uh, where up at those high horsepower settings, we, um, our anti-detonation system, ADI, we pour water and methanol directly into the induction to cool the induction temperature and some of the methanol gets burned off, the water goes through the engine, but it cools the engine enough to where you can lean the mixture out to take the, uh, the horsepower closer to the peak of the stoichiometric burn. So uh, we're get, that's how we get the maximum horsepower. And you can see the, the fuel flow goes from about 2,700 down to about 2,500 pounds an hour fuel flow. The horsepower jumps about two or 300 horsepower when we do that. But if the ADI, this mixture of water and methanol, were to quit going into the induction system, we would uh, blow up the uh, blow up the engine in a heartbeat because uh, the engine would be running too lean. Just like on the model airplane engines, if you lean that thing out too much, past peak RPM, and take off and fly around, come on down, you're going to have a nice cylinder scored in your model airplane engines. Been there, done that. Aerodynamically, the rear bear to fly around in the benign flight regime is, is, uh, is, is just like any other airplane. When we get it up to speed, uh, several things start happening. The directional stability starts to decrease. We always have good roll control. The pitch forces start to increase, although we keep the center of gravity as far aft as we can to uh, reduce what they call a balancing tail load from the elevator pulling down, or the stabilizer pulling down which uh, gives you less total lift that you have to generate, which reduces the drag, lets your airplane go faster. However, even, uh, even that being said, at the uh, higher speeds, the pitch forces really start to increase. 
So, and with the, particularly with the three blade prop, this is with the four blade prop on there, it's not as bad because it's, it's a hollow blade uh, aerodynamic airfoil. With that old three blade prop on there, the mass of that, uh, the uh, gyroscopic forces from the, that spinning mass of the propeller would, uh, you know, if you take a top and you try to tilt it one way, it wants to go, it wants to go 90 degrees the opposite direction. So, those of you familiar with uh, full scale flying, uh, know that when you generate what we call an angle of attack, you've got to press on the right rudder, like on takeoff or like going into a, a steep turn or something like that, to keep the, the ball coordinated in the center. Uh, with the uh, three blade prop, the gyroscopic forces going around a left hand turn actually want to swing that nose to the right. And so it's a take, it would take about 70 pounds of bottom rudder to hold the the ball coordinated in the center going around those turns. So I would trim it so I'd be holding about 20 pounds of right rudder force on the straightaways. And when I go into the turn, uh, I don't have to push about 50 pounds of top rudder. And um, with that three blade prop, it would get things vibrating so much you could, uh, it actually kind of shakes your eyeballs. <laughs> and here's one of the, this is actually uh, on the race course. 2008 when we had a problem and uh, the gear had to come up all the way, the lights, uh, we'd have problems with the, with the uh, uh, indicating switches that turn on the gear up light and so I just thought it was a false no up light when we started that, the, that race. Finished that race and uh, later on we couldn't get the gear, the right uh, main gear was stuck up, we went through a lot of gyrations, finally got it down and uh, landed happily. But you got to cool off the pilot, got to cool off the airplane because sometimes things break. And uh, that was the next day. The previous slide was on, uh, no, it was on Friday. Uh, this is on the, the Gold Sunday's race when the motor blowed up on us and then uh, we had to come back and land it. So let's see, a dead stick landing uh, in 85, the motor blowed up. 86, 92, they did the same thing. We had the ignition failure ride, the, the, it just shut off the ignition on the engine during qualification, I pulled it up, glided down, landed. 96, the engine blew it up again, 2007, we had a, a stuck throttle after the gold race. We won the race in 2007 and pulled up and I couldn't get the, the throttle back. What had happened was a long, long story, but a piece of Bondo came off the cowling, the right cowling went up through the whole induction system and jammed itself in the butterfly of the carburetor so we couldn't get the throttle off. <laughs> turn off the ignition key and the right now landed and turned out okay. And this is uh, this picture here is 2008 again when the motor blowed up on us. So those of you who have had the opportunity to go to the Reno Air Races, if you walk around, you notice as you walk through the pits, you see that there's always a few people hanging around the, the Strega pit, around the Dago Red pit, around. Somebody else's pit. When you go up to the, around by the rear bear, you're always going to find 20 or 30 people hanging around the rear bear pit. It is a crowd favorite. It has a cult following, if you will. And uh, so that's one of the things that made it so much fun for me to have the privilege to be involved in, uh, in working with the team and, and being able to fly the airplane. Uh, the worst part of the, the race is before you climb in the cockpit. Thinking about it, I, uh, I lay in bed at night, you know, put myself down on the race course, my heart starts beating fast, just thinking about it. And, uh, but when, once you climb in, get the engine cranking, everybody's checking on the radio, um, it, everything kind of gets down to business. You're focusing on the task at hand to get the airplane out there, fly a good formation, get down on the race course. And so you're really focusing on, on what needs to be done in order to max perform the airplane. And so you're really, you know, not a whole lot of time to think about being scared or nervous or anything else when that happens. Um, one of the things about uh, Reno, uh, which is kind of like NASCAR and all those things, we have safety rules uh, about racing out there. Um, like if you're going to pass somebody, you can't go on the inside of uh, inside the, a pile, you know, to a, to a pylon turn. You either have to pass above or on the outside of. Them unless they are flying excessively wide towards the deadline and you're going so much faster and you're on a straightaway. Um, those kinds of things, uh, you, you can't, if there's somebody who you see coming up on your wing there, you're not allowed to really turn right into them because 
uh, that will cause pro uh, a problem with uh, them at their flying formation on you coming around the race course. It's, it's, uh, we've had our problems out there. We've had blown engines. We've had dead stick landings. We've had unsuccessful landings out of some of those. Uh, we've lost a few people. Uh, but but um, overall, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good uh, sport where we, we try to pride ourselves in taking all the safety precautions we need to. Now, prior to 2007, the airplane was owned by a gentleman named Lyle Shelton. He set the world three kilometer speed record with it. Uh, he ended up in, in 2006, there was another fellow that he had raced in the airplane. It was a long, complicated story, a lot of politics. Uh, <clears throat> he blowed up the motor uh, during qualification and they forgot to turn on the switch. So Lyle Shelton couldn't, uh, couldn't financially run the rear bear anymore. So Mr. Rod Lewis, who is a Texas oil and natural gas uh, businessman, um, bought the airplane and poured lots of money into its restoration. We found a lot of things that, uh, boy, had we known it before, we wouldn't have flown the airplane that way. Uh, Dave Cornell, our crew chief, was telling me, tore the airplane basically down to the ground. And uh, so it's in better condition, safer today than it's ever been in its racing history. Uh, the, uh, we put a different, and we were so tight on the schedule in 2007, getting up to race week. It was uh, one week before uh, race week started, the airplane was in white primer. So we hired a guy to come up from Chino and say, just put a paint scheme on there. And um, this is not the most popular paint scheme, but uh, I mean, when you take a look, look at those little white swimmers on there, <laughs> we call it the 500 mile an hour sperm bank. <laughs> 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 Dago Red, the P-51 Mustang, had been our competition up to about 2007. And in 2007, uh, Mike Brown was our primary competition and, and September Fury. Now, September Fury, that airplane itself has now been bought by Rod Lewis also. And uh, we we're, we're still don't know what we're going to do with it in terms of turning it into a race or not. Mike Brown decided to leave our racing after 2008. Um, we won that race. We had been dog, we'd been dogging behind. We were looking for horsepower all week long, and uh, we found there was one tiny little spring and a valve that that uh, adjusts fuel going into the carburetor, and it was not proper. Then we fixed that. And on Sunday morning, Sunday morning of the championship race before the race, we finally captured that horsepower. We knew that we had Mike Brown, and uh, happily we, we won that race. But that's when we ended up at that dead stick. Uh, this picture here, you can see this gray coming back here. That's not engine smoke. That is the Bondo that got chewed up by the engine, that went through the engine, that, that didn't get stuck on that carburetor butterfly valve. There was a big old chunk that sucked that carburetor uh, butterfly valve, but uh, happily it didn't cause the engine to blow up. When that, when that happened, coming around final on eight, the engine faltered a little bit, and uh, I knew that there was something not right. It was shaking for about uh, 20 seconds, and the torque was dropping, which means the horsepower is dropping. And um, so I pulled up a couple hundred feet on the race course and asked my crew chief if we had smoke. And um, once he confirmed that we didn't have any smoke, I went back down to the race course, but I couldn't get all the horsepower because that Bondo in the carburetor was blocking <coughs> some of the airflow going into the carburetor, which reduces your horsepower. However, we still won, and we won at the, the race at about 467 uh, miles an hour or something like that. It was not the fastest race ever flown. But like I said, after the race course, I pulled off, and the throttle was stuck, couldn't get it on back. Pulled on up, Steve Hinton and the T-33 chase plane came and joined up on me, and um, uh, he uh, was there right away. We, discuss shutdown strategies. We didn't know what it was. Didn't know it was a mechanical jam and a cable or something. We just didn't know. We didn't find out until after, a day after the race uh, finished that this was this Bondo that uh, had, had, had burned off and fallen off the cowling. The Bondo came off as a result of a crack in an exhaust, one of the exhaust stacks that was uh, putting flame out onto the cowling and onto some structure members in the lower right part of the uh, fuselage. There and that separated the bondo, the heat did, 
and, and that's what caused the bond to go through the engine. So we uh, were up at 11,000 feet and just shut off the ignition switches, and I glided down to a safe landing, and, and uh, I surprised myself with probably the best landing I had all week. <laughs> This is Mr. Rod Lewis. He's the owner of the Rare Bear. This was uh, a, a, an excited and very happy crew after our victory in 2007, which is which is probably, for me personally, was the best victory we ever had. Uh, I've been privileged. Uh, Larry was asking how many times I've won the Reno Air races. I haven't won the Reno Air races. I've been privileged to be flying the Rare Bear when our team won four Renos. It's always a team effort. So in 2008, uh, we talked about the engine blowed up. We had this stick landing. It was uneventful. In 2009, uh, we had a spare engine, uh, I mean a uh, stock engine in the airplane, with just a, a nose case that would allow us to run the engine at a higher RPM. But we didn't have our regular uh, uh, heart or, uh, supercharger, blower we call it. And so uh, we were only able to develop about 3,100 horsepower. So we came in second place uh, behind young Steve O'Hinton here. And this, uh, during this race, uh, Steve was 22 years old. He's the son of a very famous uh, warbird pilot named Steve Hinton, Sr. And um, Steve and I are very, very close friends. I'm really good friends with young Steve over here, a uh, young kid, young whippersnapper, but he just, this is the airplane Strayo, which right now stands on top of the heat. And he flies that airplane better than anybody I've ever seen fly uh, Strayo. I just think the world of him, he's a very humble man, uh, very quiet. Uh, he works with, uh, closely with the crew. He works on the airplane himself also. And uh, he's the future of air racing. I had to tell Steve over here last year, I said, you realize that by the time you get to be my age, you could have won 40 Renos. <laughs> it's actually 40 years younger than I am. So this was the start of the race in, uh, in 2010. We had our race engine going, but uh, we were unable to uh, fully break in the engine, so I was limited on the horsepower. I'm not just going to push it up and break the engine uh, and uh, race out there without any uh, without a head on your shoulders. On Sunday, the wind came up to about 38 miles an hour, and uh, that basically limited us to only being able to use one runway, the east-west runway, at Reno State Airport, because the other runways, there's too much crosswind for the airplanes to be able to safely land. You say, well, heck, you know, everybody take off line on one runway. Well, the problem is, if somebody blows up an engine, and has to come back and make a dead stick on that runway, and if they shut down the runway, and then if somebody else blows an engine, they have no place to land. Or if this happens towards the end of the race, all the rest of the racers are hanging around up there, and then some of them run out of gas while they try to get an airplane that may have cr uh, crumped on the runway uh, clear. So this was the first time in the history of the Reno Air Races that the uh, promoter of the Reno Air Race Association canceled the Sunday Gold Race. And it's fortuitous that they did because we found out, due to some problems with our oil cooling system, I probably wouldn't even made it to the join-up after take off to uh, join the rest of the flight to come down the, uh, the race course. So we finished in second place because uh, we were awarded second place because that's where we finished on Saturday afternoon. So, again, second place is just awful. Uh, Larry was talking about my daughter. I got a, as a proud daddy, I got to brag. Uh, she was an F-16 pilot. She, she has had to leave the F-16 uh, due to some family. Uh, commitments, and she's now flying a transport out of Washington, D.C., but uh, she has two combat tours and gave us our two granddaughters. Mm -hmm. One day she'd like to uh, race the rear air but this last year she didn't get to race a piston-driven unlimited airplane, but she did race an airplane called the uh, Raju Grace, and uh, an L a stock L-29, and she uh, was able to beat all the other stock L-29s and finish second place in the silver race on Sunday, so uh, my wife and I and her, her twin sister are all very, very proud of her. So I did the best I could to uh, give her all the tips I knew about reason, but she didn't need them. She did just fine by herself. Second place was over 410 miles an hour. This is my wife, Stephanie. And this, uh, 
these aren't sisters. <laughs> she is her mother. <laughs> Tell me the gray hairs on the dad. <laughs> so if Heather ever gets to jump into Mary Bear, which I it's an exciting thought, but I as knowing all the things that uh, I've had to face and some of them which came out okay due to luck. I just I, I couldn't stand by and watch my daughter fly the rear bear, but she's gonna do just fine at the jet class. So meanwhile the I'll just drive around the fields in the uh, in the bird trial, of course we have parked out a front range out here and hang around there. So I'm a modeler also. So okay, trivia. Any of you old guys who flew control line, anybody recognize this shape? Know what model that would come from? Smoothie? Sorry? Smoothie? Close. T bird. Who said that? You win. Yeah. That's a Thunderbird. You know. I still still have that uh, it's a it's a good good flying control line. I, I do. Uh, I have. I have not, I'm not current in RC, but I have uh, a bunch of RC models at home too. So, anyway, back to the crew uh, and the team. I'll tell you what. Uh, every single one of the pilots, those of us who race out there, Reno, we'd be the first to say that we're just the guys who get to ride around in circles around a race course. And there's, you know, we have a job to do. We do that. But. Uh, we couldn't do what we do out there in a race course, and the the, the, uh, the unfortunate thing is that the pilots always get all of the, uh, uh, the attention from the press, and the aviation press, and whatnot, and all the adoration of the fans. And, and, uh, but it's really the, the team and the crew that makes this thing uh, make this airplane go fast. So I, I, uh, my heart goes out to them with uh, nothing but appreciation for everything that they sacrifice and do because it takes time away from families. It costs them money to do this, and uh, these guys are just the best. And uh, one of these days, uh, we'll come to an end for me to find a rare bear, but it's been a good run. So, questions? Yes, sir. That's been extremely interesting, and all well and good. But tell us what it physically feels and sounds like when you start that puppy up. <laughs> 4,000 horsepower can blow your mind. Jeez. Well, when you start it up, you're not developing 4,000 horsepower. Well, I <laughs> well again, and I described the sort of the starting procedure for the airplane, starting it up. Uh, but it's it's you're really fo focusing on the on the task at hand, and the things you're doing. But when it, when it gets cranked up, it, the engine runs pretty smooth. When you're sitting here idling, we idle it at about uh, 800 RPM, 800 to 1,000 RPM on the engine. The engine and the prop are reduced to 3.28 uh, to one reduction, so that when we're running 3,200 3, horsepower, we're running less than 1,000 RPM uh, on the uh, on the propeller itself. But when you get it up to power, uh, you know you got a hold of something, <clears throat> and that torque <laughs> and that torque goes up to about 275 psi in the torque gauge. When you're running 3,200 3, RPM. That engine is only about five feet in front of you on the other side of the firewall. Um, it's it, it really is an awesome thing to behold. Uh, you can just feel the energy in the airframe. <coughs> but we try to keep the engine and prop combination balanced to the point where it, it doesn't just shake and rattle and roll as you're flying it along. I described that the, the vibration from the fleet, three blade prop. That's because of those big old wide blades on the prop hitting, uh, pumping. Uh, air onto the airframe, causing vibration in the airframe. But it, it uh, and again, when you get up to uh, that horsepower and you're in a race, uh, I really don't sit there and focus on, gee whiz, you know, this is, sure is a lot of horsepower, it really feels kind of neat. You're, you're looking at the guy that may be out in front of you or trying to look for that shadow, the guy behind you on the race course, and there, there are so many other things that, that really come to mind, because as long as the engine is running healthy, uh, that throttles up there in the forward left-hand corner, and the RPMs on up there. And, and uh, as long as you can see that the engine parameters are within uh, the, uh, the range where they're supposed to be, your attention really goes on to flying a good course. In a competitive race. Yes, sir. Well, this may be a dumb question, but are the linkages 
Are the control surfaces hydraulic or mechanical? They're all mechanical. Oh, wow, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this is, this is a, we don't have any, the question was if we have hydraulic controls in this airplane. No, we don't. The only thing that's hydraulic in the airplane is the landing gear. The flap system was hydraulic, but that's been removed. But uh, on the ailerons out there, uh, you may have seen uh, some uh, little tabs. They're called servo tabs. And they actually, uh, they fly the ailerons when you're up at speed. And when you're on the ground, you can have somebody hold on to the ailerons and hold them in one spot, and you can move the stick back and forth, and those tabs will go. So it's actually the tabs that are driving the ailerons. You move, if, you know, if they're not holding on to that, when you're at low speed and you move the stick, uh, you are imparting some force to the ailerons themselves. The elevator uh, does not have servo tabs on it, and the rudder doesn't have servo tabs on it. But, um, uh, up at speed, the uh, rudder is, is very, very sensitive, so I'm um, constantly, you can't just let go of the, uh, the rudder pedals because the airplane will swing sideways. How, how close are you to the other airplanes when you're racing? Well, um, that one picture where you saw where we were just on the start on Sunday, uh, in, uh, or on Saturday in 2000, in this last year, that was actually, we had a pretty good spread on this right there. At that point, but you try to, if you're going to pass somebody, you try to come in and fly as close as you can to them because the further you're out, the longer you're going to fly around a race course. So, are you okay. three feet from them or 10 feet or what? Oh, uh, maybe 10 feet, 10, 15 feet or so. At 500 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the environment like in the cockpit? Is it hot? Is it it gets warm in there. Um, we, in previous years, we had uh, our uh, firewall was not sealed quite as good as it should have been. And uh, uh, we uh, measured the temperature in there during one of the races, and it got up to 130 degrees. <laughs> There's air flowing through there. It was like a blast furnace also. Uh, we closed down all the air vents because at that speed, the ram rise. And, uh, just the airspeed of the temperature coming in there goes up, goes up to quite a few degrees. And back in my younger day, they measured they, the crew said, "Let's measure it before you, let's weigh it before you, you know, take off or weigh after the race." And I lost six pounds. <laughs> you just can't tell right now. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, it's all, it, it's, it's, you're sweating all that out. John, do you have to worry about the wingtip vortex of other airplanes? Uh, yeah, you do. Uh, the uh, wake turbulence from other airplanes can be really, really uh, uh, make it a lot of work for you. Um, we get bumped around quite a bit. The rare bear chews through that stuff, but I'll tell you what, particularly when we were running three blade prop, the uh, other racers said if they ever got into the wake of the rare bear, they've had Mustangs that were flipped to 120 degrees of bank and whatnot. So it's, uh, it's there. <coughs> You try to you try to re predict where that where that uh, wake turbulence is going to be for somebody that you're following, and try to stay just slightly above that. If you get down and you get beat up, anytime you're getting beat up like that, that creates drag, it slows you down. And a related question. Sorry, I don't mean to hog the floor here, but I noticed you flipped the wings. I'm wondering why, and doesn't that increase your tip drag quite a bit? Um. <clears throat> The, it's a compromise because uh, we clip three, three feet off the wing tips and that reduces the profile of drag considerably. When we are uh, up at speed, the uh, uh, angle of attack that we have to generate to get those turns, we try to keep the G's oh, down to three and a half to four G's. There are times when uh, just because of geometry on the course or or uh, lap traffic. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen six and a half G's on the G meter, but some of that may have been in the turn in turbulence. But uh, anytime you're turning, when you're turning, you increase angle attack, that increases the uh, induced drag. But uh, the airplane is faster, the wings clipped. Yeah. What, on your landing, your approach, what's the speed? Uh, what's the stall speed and what's the touchdown speed? Well, the stall speed, again, is about, uh, um, about 95, 96 miles an hour. And so in the landing pattern, and the, and the gear limit lowering speed is 140 knots, 
the airplane is very, very clean. When, I, when we come out of the cool down, after a race we'll go into a cool down, they come out of there and enter the downwind leg. Uh, this airplane wants to clip along at 180 or uh, 200 miles an hour, even with the throttle way back, the, with the manifold pressure back to about 20 inches and the RPM back to about 2200. And so what I do, in, in order to keep them under boosting it, which is hard on an engine, pulling the manifold pressure back too far, is to up there and down and like this, G it up and just do several turns <clears throat> and, and slow the airplane on down. And then when I see it's getting close to 140, I just pull the nose on up, gear on down, get two green lights. We turn base at uh, 150 knots indicated. As we see, we're lining up or getting close to uh, uh, coming around a final approach. I'll throttle them back and slow it on down to about 125 on final approach. And the nose is up in the air, you can't see over the nose. So instead of flying straight on final approach, I'll fly an angling final, uh, final turn to the runway and uh, angle, uh, angling final approach. And uh, at the last minute, as I see, as the uh, runway starts to go out of sight, uh, and I see, but I can see the, uh, <coughs> the side, uh, the runway lights, I'll roll out uh, just over the overrun, line up with the runway, and, uh, and then settle it down there. Crossing the fence at about uh, 115, touching down about 105 in the three-point attitude. said earlier that the Strega seems to be on top of the heap right now. Do you feel that that's because of the young pilot? Are their engine uh, set up or their airframe that they fly? Or yes and yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> they've, uh, they've done an awful lot. Uh, and again, Steve-O, he actually he, he works on Mustangs all the time, so he does a lot of stuff. They, they've done a few things to uh, optimize the drag and the airframe. But uh, young Steve will fly his uh, airplane around the course better than anybody I've ever seen fly that airplane straight up. So he's, 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 the, he's the guy to beat now. But if we get everything going right, and I, uh, our boy loss system is like 95% there this last year. This, this coming year, I think uh, we're going to have uh, our backup pilot, Stuart Dawson, race the airplane. He's done an awful lot of stuff for Ron Lewis. It might be his turn, but. Um, uh, if, if everything goes right, that airplane, uh, our airplane of Bears should go out and be able to spank straight up. That was my next question, was what is, what's the plans for this year? To win it. Is there somebody? Yes, sir. How did you become the uh, one of the pilots for the Rare Bear? Um, <clears throat> question was, how did I become uh, one of the pilots for the Rare Bear? I, uh, during my layoff in United Airlines, I got a job at a place called Learfan out in Reno, Reno State Airport, that's where the races are. Uh, Lyle Shelton, who owned the airplane, kept breaking his airplane, parking the airplane on our ramp. I, uh, <clears throat> I was flying F-4s to guard. Lyle Shelton had previous Navy time flying A-4s. Um, I would go out and I'd help the crew uh, get the airplane ready to go again and, and uh, actually uh, did a lot of did a lot of FaceTime, did a lot of work with the crew for uh, three or four years prior to the first time I flew it. I got some uh, Mustang time, some T6 time, and he asked me to uh, be his backup pilot about the same day that I was going to take my resume and ask him if I could join the, uh, the crew as a pilot. So um, <clears throat> that was in 1984. I first raced the airplane in 1985. And um, from 85 on through about uh, 93, Lyle and I uh, traded off, and he had a string of victories from uh, 88 to 91, and uh, which was uh, unprecedented at the Reno Air Races. And then uh, I came on and uh, we, I raced it in uh, 94 and won Phoenix and won Reno, our team won Reno. And uh, I was the primary pilot from that point on through this year. We've had one of the guy at least here for a while in 1999. Um, he blew it up the motor. And the guy who, Lyle and I kind of went our separate ways in 2005, after 2005. And, uh, the guy he hired to uh, race here for blew it up the motor. So, anyway, it's, a, it's been a privilege 
to work with this uh, work with this crew. It's uh, been a, a, an absolute privilege and an honor to be able to drive an airplane like this mm -hmm. and do the things that we've done with it. And it's a privilege to come and talk to you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.